Nani? What is that? Shadowverse. Greetings, I am Shad, and you might have noticed that Rings of Power is released. I've noticed too, in fact, I've been reviewing it on my channel Night's Watch, but this isn't a review of the story characters, this is a look at the armour and weapons, because that's what we do here on Shadowversity, I'm very interested to see how well they have done, and as you might have guessed from the cold open, <laughs> I have thoughts to share, okay? Uh, so, oh look at this, it's, it's, it's chainmail print hoodie, it's almost like it could be in Rings of Anyway, we'll keep moving. But before we do that, huge announcement, the launch campaign for the graphic novel adaptation of my novel, uh, Shadow of the Conqueror, is now live. Not only can you get the graphic novel adaptation, if you like, with many variant covers, you can actually get the second edition version of Shadow of the Conqueror, and we're doing something really awesome and special. We're also doing high quality leather bound versions. And so this is like a real premium awesome thing. You might have been able to tell, I love leather bound novels. Now you can get Shadow of the Conqueror in leather bound or the graphic novel adaptation of it in leather bound. There's also a new cover as well and special collector covers. Uh, it's really, really awesome. There is even an expansion on the story in the graphic novel adaptation of Shadow of the Conqueror where you actually get some more story than what was in the novel. We're separating the four parts, so that means we don't have to cut anything and we can actually add some stuff back in. Stuff that uh, might be really interesting to those of you who are fans of my book or just fans of graphic novels in general. I went all out, got the best artist, Mike S. Miller, who did The Hedge Knight. This is Game of Thrones prequel series. Uh, he worked directly with George Martin, and uh, this is his art. And check out some of the art that is in uh, the Shadow of the Conqueror graphic novel. Some of the best work he's ever done. So this is top, top tier quality graphic novel. I really think you guys will love it. And also, the more successful this is, the more I want to reinvest and make even more graphic novels. Not only volume two of the graphic novel adaptation for Shadow of the Conqueror, but superhero graphic novels and everything like that. If this is successful enough, I can reinvest it and push it even further. So go check it out, grab a graphic novel and share it. Please do share it to try and push this thing as far as possible. Okay, so rings of power, weapons and armor. I'll be looking at the promotional images as well as the, as the uh, weapons and armor that we've seen up to the episodes that have been released, which is three episodes out at the moment. I'm not a fan of this adaptation, let's just say that, but uh, is there a redemption in the weapons and armor? Well, I know there's already a, a sword or two that I like the design of, so let us uh, have a look at the, 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 one of the first promotional images that were released for rings of power. We haven't seen this in the show yet, but of course we will. And that is Galadriel in her breastplate, kind of hybrid-like armor, um, breastplate and chain, but it might be closer to full plate. Okay, uh, interesting. There's, uh, there's more to comment on in regards to this armor than you might suspect. Uh, at, on the surface, it looks really, really good. And there are some good elements in it, but it fails in a couple little points of execution. First, my compliments. I like that it has a feminine shape to it, okay? She's a female warrior, and it's doing one of those things that I've kind of commented on in regards to boob armor. If you just, because usually armor has a bulge to deflect things, if you just rage that bulge a bit to present the bust, it would look very feminine. That's what they did here. Unfortunately, I feel the breastplate is a bit too low, but I'll right, save that for possible criticisms. Uh, other things I like, I like the kind of design, uh, the flowing design that they have on it. I think it has a very pleasing aesthetic look to it. And I like that they have also tried to integrate some uh, historical elements. Not perfectly, but but there are, there, there are some there. I like how they've done the counters. These are like the elbow cops right here, and how they do wrap around, but they fold in to give her high mobility. That's just, you know, it's a good execution. It's good to see, ah, look, there's that there. And now we need to get to some of the criticisms, because there are some just kind of odd things. And I'll start with, it looks like the breastplate is going down too low. And it does flare out a little bit. Maybe it'll get a bit of movement. And it really kind of depends on her figure. It just looks to be sitting a, a tiny bit too low. It's not, it's not a big one, because it doesn't seem to be excessively. And especially that it's higher on the sides and it kind of goes down the middle. Could be tricking my eye, just a tad. But I I think if it was just a little bit higher, you know, uh, that would give the right mobility for a breastplate. Because if you try and do this and it's too low, it'll dig in on the side. Now, it doesn't have a fold. In fact, what they do have is something that's a pet peeve in many fantasy armor. They have these kind of side metal bits hanging off. Some people identify these as tassets. Tassets are usually uh, kind of thigh guards that you 
more often are hanging down in front of the legs underneath a fold. And now, and so if they're tassets, they're in the wrong position and probably the wrong shape uh, as a result. But it's the closest thing you could kind of identify where they've just hung them on the side of the breastplate, leaving the front part of the groin completely exposed. Well, she's got mail there. I'll talk about this uh, chain mail in a second. But that's nowhere near as protective as a proper fold. And uh, they could have integrated a fold really nicely into this armor, so it's a bit baffling why it's not there. And instead, these annoying side fantasy cliche tacity things, which I, look, I just don't like. Then there is the matter of the chain mail. We see this type of chain mail early on in episode one as well, and it seems like she's wearing similar type. Uh, I'd be interested to find out where she gets this armor in the TV show, because this type of chain mail seemed to have come from the elves. All the elves wearing it looks like it was supposed to be elven-like armor. And uh, if she's armoring up and going off to war in the location where she's currently in episode three, uh, I'll be I'll be wondering where does she get the armor. But if this is just elven armor, okay, it's the elven chainmail. The issue I have is it is so ragged, almost like mismatched. It looks really uh, I just cheap as a result, and it's extremely thin. At first I thought, well, it's because it's Mithril. Mithril can get away with being extremely thin, yet the plot of the show might be implying that Mithril isn't discovered yet. Where you that's not a spoiler because it hasn't been confirmed. This is my own speculation. But if it, it turns out to be true, this would have to be metal. And if it's not magical of some kind, chainmail this thin would not be very protective at all. It would not stop a good thrust, okay? It's way too thin. And then on top of this, all these additional folds. See how it's kind of spilling out from, uh, you know, the gaps of the... Well, these aren't really pauldrons, they're, they're more spolders. So a spolder is like a smaller pauldron that doesn't cover the entire kind of shoulder. Uh, pauldrons usually are bigger and they have side parts that kind of move in and cover a bit of the chest even. So these, yeah, more like spolders. And then the chainmail is just spilling out in between. This would actually restrict movement, especially if it gets caught on things and you're trying to move around. You want mail to be hopefully tailored, hugging the skin, and even if it's not loose, it can be loose, we see it in medieval art, but not this loose, so much that it's bunching up and and uh, and all these, it's making kind of rolls and layers, which will just cause additional weight and potentially get caught on things. So I'm not a fan of that either. I'm wondering where her gauntlets are. She's uh, got, you know, the armor all the way down her arms and then just stopping right at the hands. Uh, in combat, the hands can be quite vulnerable. You want to protect those. So as a result, there's some good things and bad things about this armor design. I don't mind the sword. There's a, a bit of additional weight on the cross guard, where you have the, cross, the lower cross guard, but then it kind of comes up to meet the blade. If that's not too heavy, maybe it was hollow on the inside of these parts that come up, you could still have a functional cross guard and have that a little bit of embellishment. Uh, now, you know, there could be magical enchantments it isn't really shown though, both on the sword and the armor to make it lighter. Not sure. And if this chainmail is made out of mithril, then what is the point of wearing plate over top? Mithril's basically invulnerable anyway. Okay, we need to talk about this one. We haven't seen uh, the, the queen in this armor yet in the show, but this is a promotional image. And uh, like I think a lot of people pointed out, I've mentioned this on Night's Watch. Uh, look at the uh, layer of armor underneath the kind of scale breastplate. If you see right there, it's it's a printed scale pattern on cloth. Quite similar to how this is a printed chainmail pattern on cloth. Now, this is just, you know, to get the look. It's not meant to be real and it's not in a high budget production where this is. <laughs> this comes off extremely cheap. Now, if you're wondering, this chainmail print, it's a chainmail print hoodie I wear underneath uh, this surcoat. It's a, I sell it. It's available in my Teespring store. So go, go get it if you want. And it's great for casual wear because it kind of shows, hey, it's, you know, I like medieval stuff, but it's not trying to say that or pass as authentic. Where, <laughs> though it is a print of authentic riveted mail. So it, on, it looks cool when you look close, but again, not a high budget film production. And that's what they have there, and it looks incredibly cheap and fake. Like, what were they thinking? I can't believe it. And you compare this quality to, say, the quality of the Peter Jackson trilogy, where they had brocades that were never even seen on film in underlayers of the costumes and stuff. They went all out. They spent hours making actual, like, you know, plastic chain mail to make it look cool, and it looked great on film. And here they couldn't even do authentic scale mail underlayer. Um, now, 
It could be because scale mail isn't the best pick, especially for an underlay. They could just be wearing chain mail underneath the scale. That could work. It's uh, not the only problem with this armor though, because uh, the breastplate, I have a lot of questions. Don't care, I, I hate, it, it, it's a type of boob plate. All right, uh, good to see, okay, no complaints. I think it's perfectly justified for uh, female armors and stuff. One one of the issues though is that um, the, uh, the bust on the boob plate is higher than the line of her chest, you can actually see. So the line of her bust would start here lower from where the armpit is lower, and the bust of the, of the armor is like way higher, and so it's not even properly shaped for her. Uh, the other thing is that it's supposed to be scale mail. One of the advantages and reasons why you do scale mail is that it's flexible and gives you mobility. This is a rigid plate, and so causes a lot of questions. Either it's it's actual metal and they just stuck scales on top of it, which makes the question, why do you even bother putting the scales on top if it's already a rigid breastplate made out of metal? You're just adding additional weight and not much greater protection. And if it's, uh, say, uh, like hardened leather or some kind to get the shape and uh, you're putting scale, then it's defeating the purpose of scale mail because it's rigid and not flexible. And one of the advantages of scale mail is it being flexible. And so, and it loses on either like perspective on why they're doing it. And so I just get like mixed messages from that armor. And then scale mail braces, like look at the forearm guard, the bracer there. Why? That's all, again, it's it's on a, the scales are stuck on a rigid thing. If this is aesthetic, one, it's not the best looking aesthetic kind of design you can do just like scales because reasons, right? You could do patterns, embossing, or like, like carvings, all these really nice, interesting things on a rigid surface, and they decide to just stick scales on it, if it's just aesthetic. And the, the bracer here really shows that like, it's, it's rigid. Why do you add scales on it? If, if it is aesthetics, then it's just, there's no point. And we see the same thing even on the horse coat of armor there as well. And so this armor is a complete mess and it really comes off low budget because of the print scale underneath. <laughs> I can't believe that I'm able to match their quality with a chamber print hoodie. Uh, it's just awful on many levels. She's got a cool looking sword. The sword looks great. Okay, yeah, big thumbs up for that. But this isn't the only place we see odd looking kind of scale mail on what looks to be rigid plates. It's the dwarves. Uh, in episode two specifically, they're wearing like, oh, like <laughs> at least they're wearing what looks to be kind of flexible coats of scale, bit better, but the shoulder piece pieces look to be on a rigid surface. And maybe if it's leather and, and just to get the shape of the shoulder, I could kind of, acknowledge maybe, maybe uh, this one works a little bit better. I do question the helmets, like um, by having a metal kind of integrated face that goes all the way down, so it's a metal beard on these helmets, you wouldn't be able to move. As soon as you turn your head here, the metal, you know, beard would just knock, it wouldn't, it would be so restrictive. It's a, I, I know it's for aesthetics, but it doesn't look good because if we see their real beards just flying out under, just have their actual beards. Oh, so that's bizarre. I'm not a fan of their axes. I feel their axes are overbuilt and they look, they're double headed axes and they look to be completely equivalent, symmetrical on either side. It's not only the first time we've seen double bitted, you know, combat battle axes in Lord of the Rings. Gimli has one and I criticize Gimli's one as well because I think it's not a good design and it's a bit redundant if they're doing the exact same thing on both ends. Check out my video on talking about double bitted axes. And then we, yeah, so the dwarves have them. And, and the other question that I have about dwarves and axes, right? They don't chop down wood a lot. One of the kind of e obvious through lines with uh, having an axe as a weapon is that first it's a tool, but it's also quite lethal and uh, you could pick it up as a weapon as well. You could say they're craftsmen and they like to work with wood. Still, they clearly work with stone and metal far more, which to me means picks and hammers if you wanted to do a cultural connection. But are they even the best weapons for dwarves? Well, I have a video talking about the best weapons for shorter people. Check it out, Fantasy Rearmed. An old one, but a classic. Durin is wearing some type of armor. It's like a, a weird spiky kind of thing underneath his uh, cloak there. I don't see the point, okay? I mean, the, these spikes, if you, if you, like a strike landed on them, they're, they're so uh, geometrical, you know, they're smooth. They'll just slide off into the uh, thinner portion of the armor. And so having these parts where it's just thicker in different areas wouldn't add extra protective value because you have the thinner parts in between the spikes, which uh, would, you know, 
be the area where all the strikes actually get funneled and the weak points. And so there's no point apart from aesthetics, but you're also adding way more weight than what's necessary for this armor. So look, it's ridiculous and it's an awful armor design. Check out what this lady's wearing though in the background now. That is some boot plates. My goodness, it put Madonna to shame. Alrighty, with the battle scene that we see uh, at the beginning of episode one, and we get a close up of some of the, you know, armor that the elves are wearing, and I, I like it, you know, the cooter there on uh, the, the shoulder, good looking pauldron. I am wondering where are the gauntlets? Why isn't anyone just using gauntlets here? The vulnerable part, and it, like, if your hands get struck in combat, that in almost can incapacitate you completely from the battle. You can handle like maybe a cut in a couple of other areas of equivalent size and survive and keep fighting. But that's a cut that big on your hand could chop off fingers and incapacitate you from using a weapon completely. So protect your hands. What's going on? But look at the helmet here. That's almost like the rear end of a salad. And so I like that design. Uh, it curves over in front to be a bit more Greek-like. I can see this guy in the background there. It's almost like a, you know, a Greek-styled helmet at front. Look, I like the helmet. Uh, I think the armor here is mostly decent. All right, we get a good shot of this army here. Oh, the breastplate looks like it is going too low. It would make it a bit harder to move in. And where's the fold? So like, they, they go out of their way to add specific elements of protection and then ignore other bits. And it looks like he's just got like that weird elven chain mail stuff uh, hanging from a belt, which we don't know how protective it is. If it is don't, I don't think it's mithril. And a good solid strike would do damage even if it doesn't penetrate, it's just the blunt force. You wouldn't want to get hit there. I also like some of the design on the breastplate though. It looks a bit similar to the design or line work that uh, Galadriel's breastplate had. So uh, it also looks like the be a similar type of symbol. Gladriel's armor might technically be the same, just a different color, but then they don't have the chainmail kind of spilling out the gaps and the weird tacit things. Where's the fault? So same criticism, same kind of compliments with this armor. We get to see a little more of these swords. And at this point, I'm wondering, is this like the only sword design that the elves have? Because thousands of years have passed since the battle with Morgoth. And uh, this seemed to be the main sword, really only sword the elves are wearing. It, when the elves lift their swords high to you declare that they're going to war in the flashback back of episode one, it's the same sword and same swords here. I was like, wouldn't there be at least a bit of variety? And as to the design, look, I'm actually not a fan of this cross guard design. It doubles up the weight on this type of sword. It's just there for aesthetics. And so unless uh, it's hollow, doesn't add weight, there's no reason for it to be there. It's just to look nice. It's one of those bad fantasy designs where it's not completely functional. I'm not, um, uh, I don't really have a problem with the length of handle. These are exceptionally long handles for the length of blade, but there is historical precedent for it, not necessarily in, uh, you know, kind of medieval European cultures, though you could look at the sword staff as, as a mild equivalent, but there's a better equivalent in, uh, say, Asian cultures in Japan. They have the nagimaki, and that is a sword with an exceptionally long handle with a more standard two-handed length blade. And so, yeah, th there are swords like that even in our own history. Uh, it gives you a decent amount of more leverage. I'm not sure it's the best sword to pick for, you know, adventuring and traveling and such, but hey, it's the weapon that these elves are using. So even though the length of handle can be justified, it's, not a, it's the cross guard that makes me not like this one. We see Galadriel here, and it's basically really loose fitting, ragged chain mail that has like these stars stuck on. It is it looks ragtag and horrible. Like, these stars don't add great aesthetic to it. It looks like they're just, I don't know, random badges that they stick through their mail. And it's so thin, it would not be protective, this mail, very much at all. And like, look at what she's wearing, you know, the, the, the loose coif mail. And, like, if you have a look at, you know, male coifs, they... they, they hug the head, they're, 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 like, especially in medieval art, we see that they're tailored there, because this, this would, would be a problem. It could easily slip off in combat because it's so loose, and it's a bit of a trope in fantasy and things. Uh, we see it here, but we also see how thin the, these male links are. They would not be protective, okay? Um, one, if you're not wearing padding underneath a male coif, uh, blunt force would be just as devastating. And uh, I, because it's so thin, it would be much easier for a, a sword point to bust through those rings because it's really thin metal. The o and, and look how ragged it is on the edges. There's not even a fine like line like cleaning on the, on the edge of the male. It's just like it's being ripped apart. It looks awful. And the only way you could justify this type of mail is if it's mithril, yet I'm not sure it is. 
based on what they have been setting up up to episode 3, we'll see if this is confirmed. We get another close-up of this sword, and I do have a bit of a criticism here, actually. We see that the uh, handle has a grip, only so far down, and the rest of the grip is metal. And they kind of uh, did this a little bit with the sword Narsal, or Undul or something, <laughs> right? You know, it's, it's a great one, it's a great-looking one. And you can't get away if it's smaller, but with such an ex excessively long handle here, that's more metal, which would throw off the balance, and uh, it, like, it would be exceptionally heavy as a result. Again, magic, who knows? Mithril, don't know, fantasy, but if this was a practical functional sword design, there are issues with it. It would not be very functional and practical because of the excessive additional weight just thrown on it. <laughs> I saw you there, Gladiol, grabbing the sword to draw it. We, we saw the sheaths. Uh, they're not proper back scabbards. I've designed one, all right? Uh, uh, if, if anyone could claim expertise on back scabbards, I think I could, right? And yeah, they don't show you try to draw it from that sheath because you wouldn't be able to. I'm not letting you get away with it. I saw that. Get another angle of the sword here. The blade looks fine. Uh, yeah, so main criticism, as I mentioned, is the cross guard and the, it looks like a completely metal handle and pummel. Oh boy, we need to talk about this armor. This is atrocious. This is, like, oh, makes me want to gag. It looks so bad. It doesn't even look like metal. It looks like spray-painted cardboard. It's awful. And, and then other things, right? Like, it doesn't even look elven, for one. Uh, and uh, so, don't like that. I'm not sure how, like, these pauldrons, instead of extending further inwards, they extend really far downwards, so I'm not sure how functional movable it would be. And then it has this weird kind of gorget that is sitting higher than the line of the armor, and it's not even sure it's necessary because the breastplate looks like it goes right up to the neck, which would make moving the neck really difficult. And look how it kind of flares out. It looks like it has a, almost a serrated edge there that is not properly rounded. So if you would look down, you'd cut yourself. This armor is unbelievably crap. And this is from a show with an insanely high budget? Like, it is, it is awful on, on, on so many levels. And if it's supposed to be like ceremonial fancy armor, non-functional, why does it still look so crap? Ceremonial armor is usually polished, pristine, has gold inlay patterns and everything like that. This is just crappily, unpolished, metal, rough looking armor horribly shaped. It is just awful on so many levels. Okay, here's another shot of this armor, and yeah, these breastplates go down really low. Her arms are kind of blocking it, but you can see, I, like, if we look close, oh, and look at this, it's a big close-up of these swords as well. This breastplate is awful. It doesn't have any, like, nice shaping to it, where, uh, where it has a central kind of ridge to help deflect things to the side. It's more flat on the front, goes way too far down on the sides and this so there, there's like a, a gorget lower and then this neck kind of bever thing which is going too far high up and you wouldn't be able to move like if you have a look at a lot of historical bevers they instead of hugging the neck they go up in front a bit uh, to let you move your neck and then again no gauntlets <laughs> this armor is absolute dog crap i like amazon massive budget that's the quality <laughs> It looks so bad, and there. Look, I, I have uh, many, you know, criticisms of this show, and uh, I don't want to dwell too much. That, that's what I have on Night's Watch, but still, like, they have people that undress them on this boat, and this it's going to the, you know, Elven Undying Lands as a reward. But are these servants getting the reward? Are they there just undress the armor? What do they say about it? Yeah, questions, right? All right, the Elven army here. Like, is it supposed to be made out of wood? I, I, I you actually see like you know, lines going down or just cracked leather. I don't mind that it has uh, a lot of patterns, this face on it. It looks like it would double up the thickness in certain areas. And if it's doubling up the thickness on the chest, okay, that's a, that's an area where you would want the um, breastplate, sorry, cuirass to be thicker. So I don't mind that. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not really sold on uh, the uh, the color of it. It's, everything's gray. Not really sure about his spoulders here. They're pretty small, and by having it a leaf design, it looks like you might actually poke his arm when he lifts it. Uh, so, uh, 
very run of the mill, and the breastplate looks like it goes down pretty far, which would restrict, you know, side movement. He's holding his bow in an interesting way, like, like slung, uh, not slung, but you know, over his shoulder, arm through. If it's the bow is short enough, that won't hit the ground. That I, I guess that's a fine way to, you know, have a bow rest. At least he isn't like slinging it over his back where the the string just presses on your on your chest, which you know I've tried and shown that it doesn't work too well. The dwarven pick hammer things, okay? If that was a solid bit of metal, you would barely be able to lift it. This would be insanely heavy in real life. Uh, is it a fantasy metal? Are these guys just particularly strong elves, dwarves? Look, maybe. I just think of the build video from Michael Cthulhu, great YouTuber, makes amazing things, and he made this crazy big hammer, which I actually think might have less metal than what we see these things have, and he could barely lift it. It was so crazy heavy. And so if this was actual metal, Ooh. But if we try and ignore the weight, the actual design and shape, I don't mind for the purpose of what it is. It's not really a hammer, it's like it's got this hammerhead that ends in a point, as you see right there. But for the purposes of trying to crack apart stone, I think that's quite appropriate for this tool. And then you have a smaller point to do some really strong pick-like strikes to, to focus the force on, on an even smaller area. I, I think the design is pretty functional, if you ignore the weight issue. The Numenorean breastplates that they're wearing, they look to be uh, leather cuirasses. Uh, what's the plural for cuirass? I don't know. Uh, but look, in terms of function, they're actually not completely unfunctional, they just look very plain and cheap. These Numenorean breastplate cuirass things are actually a great example of how far down you want breastplates to go. They end at the right point, you know, right above the hips, hips at the rotating point to give you full maneuverability. And it's a point of reference to a lot of the other armor because they definitely went lower than that. And so in terms of the size and where they end, that's fine, but they're so plain and there's very little shaping on them. Oh look, there's a bit of a shape to present the chest, I don't mind. But they're not like muscle cuirasses and they don't have really uh, interesting, uh, you know, designs on top. They're just, they're just plain and they look cheap and maybe that's what they were going for. Doesn't look very nice, but the armor that I do have criticism is uh, the, the regular leather cuirass that the guys, maybe they pick leather because they think metal would, uh, you know, rust too easily at the sea. But in terms of leather, it, it looks actually like it's been hardened and they're holding a bit of a shape, and so uh, it wouldn't be the worst implementation of a leather cuirass I've seen in fantasy, honestly. The criticism I have is the captain's cuirass, okay? Where he has these weird ornamental kind of scale things that are sticking further out from the line of the breastplate. I see the guy behind him, how his breastplate just goes up and it kind of curves in. That means you'll be able to raise your arms because when you raise your arm, see where my arm is here? It's, it, it's sitting on the outside of my chest, but when I raise it, suddenly my arm is now in line with my chest and is right next to my head. And so that's why you need breastplates to kind of curve in like a singlet does, so you can raise your arms. They have it on the um, uh, on the captain's breastplate, but then they've added these weird scale things that extend further out. And so if he tries to lift his arm, the part that's sticking further out is just gonna dig into his arm when he gets there. It's a horrible design. It doesn't make it look better. It's just awful. And look, he has this weird kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, pattern there, which increases it. But then his breastplate looks to go even further because it has these like additional lines. And so his breastplate goes further down, which means it would be harder to rotate at the hip. Like, it's awful. His, like, this one is absolute dog crap. I actually like the plain one even better, the one that the regular sailors are wearing, because it's actually more functional. You'd be able to rotate, it's got, uh, you know, curving in at the shoulders right. Like, that's way better than the captain's one. I hate what the queen is wearing. This is like ornamental scale reason style. Like, just, anyway, it looks awful. Not, it's, it shouldn't be armor, but. It looks like they're integrating armor into fashion, just yeah, don't like it. So the armor that this uh, kind of guard is wearing, I like a lot better. So his breastplate looks to be bronze. It could be like, like golden metal. They might have put a really thin layer of bronze over top, but it ha it's a bit more of a muscle cuirass. It has a, a kind of a sun flare. It just looks better, okay? And uh, it has integrated um, shoulder guards there, which look a little bit better as well. And, uh, 
helmet looks fine. Like, I like his armor. His armor's half decent. He presents uh, this character with a sword, and I kind of like it. The only thing that throws me a little bit is the pattern on the handle. It looks like it's drawn on. It doesn't look like it's, uh, you know, a metal inlay in ivory, which I think that's what they were going for. But uh, overall, uh, yeah, it looks like a very functional longsword. I, I like it. It, it just being thrown a little bit with the handle. So a lot of the orcs are wearing, like, uh, I don't know, skin. It looks like to be, like, a crocodile skin or a snake skin armor clothing uh, and uh, their weapons are just very orcish rough and stuff i do wonder that they are conspicuously white like everything from skin to the uh, to the helmet to the clothing the armor everything like they're just some for some reason rings of power decided to make all the orcs conspicuously white in appearance i just i i I wonder why. Uh, and aside from that, yeah, ra I like rough looking weapons and things. Orcish, nothing really to praise. But I mean, the actual uh, wrinkles and appearance of the orcs, apart from the question of why they're so pale, um, uh, I, 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 yeah, the, the makeup and things look fine. The a This axe design, um, uh, it looks awful. Like, like the, he's going to try and chop down a tree with that thing? <laughs> Now I, all right, so that's one of the close-up of the orc-like weapons, and it's doubling up on the weight. You wouldn't get too much advantage out of it. And look, it's not to say you can't have very wide-bladed axe-like weapons, like say the Bardiche, but then you don't need two halves on on the handle to achieve that. And so, yeah. I don't like the axe. Even for an orc weapon, it looks awful and dumb. And those are the primary weapons and armor that we have seen in uh, promotional images and the first three episodes of Rings of Power. It's a bit of a mixed bag. It, mostly pretty poor, badly designed, with some good ones here and there. Just baffling, like, like, because if you compare it to the Jackson trilogy, Lord of the Rings, so much of the weapons and armor just chef's kiss amazing where here there's a lot of like bafflingly bad designs especially for their budget who they get to consult who they i don't know like just goes into other complaints i have with the show overall uh and if you wanted to see what those you can check out my reviews on night's watch but there we go these are the weapons armor let me know what you think in the comments below i do very much appreciate you for watching and do go check out the uh Indiegogo campaign of my graphic novel and there's going to be a different outro I'm going to share the promotional trailer for the graphic novel instead of the regular outro uh, so you can get some of the sneak peeks and taste of what the graphic novel is is offering. Once again I appreciate you for watching, hope to see you next time and also hope to see you over on the um, graphic novel launch campaign so until then, farewell. Shadow of the Conqueror is the breakout debut novel by Shad M. Brooks. Truly incredible. I absolutely loved this book. Honestly, it's one of the best books I've ever read. S. Keith Hall. Now, Shadow of the Conqueror is coming to you in an epic graphic novel adaptation with the incredibly talented art of Mike S. Miller. This will bring its dark, confronting story to fans and new readers alike in another beloved format, making the story more accessible than ever before, and enabling current fans to enjoy it in new ways. I was engrossed in the tale of the Conqueror. I laughed, cried, growled with anger, and shouted with joy. But also during this entertaining ride of emotion, I came away with mental growth and new perspective on the human condition. Andrew Johnson Mike is a 28-year veteran of the comic book industry, famous for his work on DC Comics' Injustice series and George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones-related graphic novels. I've read so many novels I've lost count, fantasy genre or otherwise, but in my opinion, this is one of the best. Seton 425 The author of Shadow of the Conqueror, Shad M. Brooks, has been a fan of both comic books and Mike's work for many years, and is thrilled to be working with him to bring this graphic novel to the highest standards possible. I don't typically listen to audiobooks multiple times, but this is my fourth time through and I'm loving it more each time. Highly recommend for anyone who loves fantasy action stories. See Barker. 
The book will be separated into four graphic novel volumes. This first one, entitled Enemies of Self, has 48 pages of stunning art visualizing the amazing and unique world of Everfall with some of the best work Mike has ever done. It must be admitted that there was a large amount of skepticism when this book was recommended. However, a story that would leave the reader hooked and begging for more was not something that was expected. The overall plot and flow of the story was simply phenomenal. I highly recommend this book. It is filled with action, humor, love, hate, science, and the psychology of the human condition. History Rewriter Separating the book into four volumes gives great opportunity to adapt more of the work and even add new content not seen in the original novel. Far from being given secondary regard as a token adaptation that doesn't accurately represent the source material, the graphic novels are being made with the intent to form a crucial part of the Everfall story, revealing fascinating aspects to the characters and world not found in any other format. Powerful and gut-wrenching. I laughed, introspected, winced, wondered, cried, and will be revisiting this world. Michael Larson. At the time of launching this Indiegogo campaign, the graphic novel is completed and ready to print. This is not to fund the creation of the graphic novel, but to give you the chance to get your hands on it. We will be able to place the print order as soon as this launch campaign ends, and you will get the graphic novel in your hands much sooner without needing to wait for the graphic novel's completion. With the launch of the graphic novel, I'm very excited to announce that during this Indiegogo campaign, I will be releasing a refined version of Shadow of the Conqueror as a second edition version. This is not the sequel, but a more refined and polished version of Shadow of the Conqueror. With an incredible new cover made by Chris McGrath, the second edition will at first be an exclusive in the Indiegogo campaign where you will be able to get your hands on a limited edition version of the second edition novel with the graphic novel covers, which will not be available ever again once this launch campaign ends. And in addition to this, we've gone even further and made premium, high-class, display-quality, collector-edition, leather-bound versions of the second edition novel and graphic novel, both of which will be available for a limited time during this launch campaign. Way better than I thought it would be. Bought because I watch Shad on YouTube. I never thought his book would be as good as this is. Kind of blown away. Jevin Curley. With special Collector Edition covers and limited Everfall merchandise, this is your one and only chance to secure these special versions of this phenomenal epic fantasy graphic novel. Just because the mainstream comic book industry is declining in both quantity and quality, doesn't mean we still can't make great graphic novels for those who love them and attract new fans to the format. Please share this Indiegogo campaign with as many people you feel would be interested and who would love to enjoy such a visually stunning and emotionally riveting story as this Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror, Volume 1, Enemies of Self.